My name is Average Joe, and I'm a proud geek with expertise in movies, superheroes, and animation. My name is Beef Pork Ribs. I'm a fine repository of esoteric knowledge, which I suppose most people would qualify as geeky. Though I dabble in many fandoms, my main areas of expertise are anime, movies, and Belgian comics, with a strong recent insurgency of D&D. Our mission is to bring nerd and geek culture to the masses. By sticking it all under the microscope. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Bat Jar, Jar Podcast. Podcast. Movies, comics, graphic novels, TV, cartoons, animation, nerds, their geeks, entertainment, culture. Here it on the Bat Jar, nerdy pound, nerds and geeks, come gather around the scene. Come and join us in the Bat Jar. Come and tune in to Average Show and we see. Come and tune in to the Bat Jar. 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 Come and tune and welcome to the Bat Jar Podcast, where we put nerd and geek culture under the microscope. And it creates a very cool visual effect that looked really great in the early 2000s, but is kind of terrible now. But it's still the aesthetic we're going to use for most of these uh, episodes. I don't know. I, 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 hmm. Okay. <laughs> Was that too much of a deep cut? <laughs> so... We mentioned last week that like Spider-Man No Way Home, the big fancy new Spider-Man movie is now out in theaters. I have had the opportunity to see it, but Beef Pork Ribs has not. And I I have no problem like spoiling most movies for Beeper because I know he doesn't like to care about spoilers in general. But Spider-Man No Way Home should be seen with as few as things spoiled for you in advance as possible. So what we're going to do tonight we're is we're going the episode to episode talking about that research that said that spoilers actually makes it more enjoyable, uh, makes a piece of media more enjoyable. <laughs> I'm kidding. Sorry. Keep me keep going. Does that actually exist? Is that a thing? Yeah, yeah it's a thing. What? Absolutely. It, okay. F- explain yourself. How, how on earth does being spoiled for something help you enjoy it more? Uh, because the idea is that if a, if something, um, if, uh, Basically, this is massive TLDR, but um, if the spoiler is something that you having it spoiled will actively ruin your enjoyment, it means that it's just kind of a shock twist that doesn't actually matter or isn't really substantial. And if it is substantial, then being able to see it happen or being set up in advance uh, builds up more anticipation, which uh, actually creates more serotonin, making it therefore more enjoyable on a chemical level, at least. All right. I'll buy that. But still, you're going to go see the movie tomorrow. Uh, this episode goes out on Monday. You'll um, see it the day oh, after yes. that. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're in the future or we're talking to people in the, in the future. future. Oh, we're definitely going to do that next episode too. Yes. Um, so all I have to say, even though the science shows, I guess it's better to be spoiled for things. I really want you to experience the movie with as few as, I mean, I think some of the things we've talked about on our podcast might be spoilers anyway, but it's all, it's all been rumors up until now. So I, so I won't this- ask you if uh, Andrew Garfield and Tommy McGuire show up. I mean, you can ask me if you want, I won't give you a straight answer. You don't have that great of a poker face, so I won't. Well, anyway, the movie's now out. It has grossed domestically. Did you hear about this? How much money the movie made? It made in its first weekend $253 million. I mean, I haven't heard, but I'm also a little bit unsurprised. Like, I... Like my wife and I were looking at and like they, they're basically half the theater is showing just that movie. Um, like it's and we, we talked to a, a friend of ours who went to see a movie this weekend. They, they went to see Encanto and it was like, yeah, our local theater wasn't playing it. And I'm like, eh, probably because of Spider-Man. So I can imagine they put a lot of eggs into that basket. And I mean, it is the real return of the MCU uh, because I think we, we talked about that last week. Uh, Eternals and uh, well, Eternals might have counted, but uh, Black Widow definitely did. So what about Shang Chi. We'll 
Oh, yeah, I guess that, that, that happened too. But that also had like the dual release, right? Uh, no, it didn't. Oh, no, that, that, yeah, that was, yeah, I guess that works too. But Shang-Chi was also. Mm. So up, up until project. today, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings was the highest grossing film of the year with $224 million. <laughs> yeah, but it it was never going to hold up to a Spider-Man movie, let's but be honest here. Just think about it. In one weekend, this Spider-Man movie has made more money than any movie in the entire year throughout their entire releases in three days. Isn't that crazy? That That is crazy. Is Dune still going up? Probably not. Uh, <laughs> Probably not that quickly. <laughs> no, Dune hasn't even hit a hundred million domestic. Ah, oh, that is its sequel was very announced, sad. so it's 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 in the clear that way. Like they will make another Dune. But I just can't it boggles my mind that more people went to see Spider Man in these three days than anyone did for any movie all year. I think people are ready for it. And you know, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but it is Spider-Man. Like, there's a reason we're about to talk about this. They rebooted the series, like, three times in the time that X-Men was only rebooted twice. Like, and I think the X-Men movie came before the Sam Raimi movie. So, like, yeah, the first X-Men movie came before the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man. So, you know, it's it's not... it's It's great. It's amazing. But it's also not, like... If you had told me that any other movie had done that, I would be a lot more surprised. As a fan, I'm overjoyed. This makes me so happy to hear that. And it like globally, it's made like five hundred and eighty six million dollars its first weekend, which means it's already the sixth highest grossing the film internationally after just one weekend. Yeah, that's a pretty nice accomplishment, too. Now, people are pointing out that the Omicron variant of COVID-19 is basically leading to a lot of either full-on shutdowns or reduction of capacity in a lot of theaters. I know where I live, uh, theaters aren't allowed to sell food anymore. So uh, we're, we're pretty unaffected, but Alberta has been uh, interesting. <laughs> well, it probably means that, unfortunately, that it's not, the movie's not going to maintain its momentum it's like it's going to see a drop off in returns i think pretty quick because there's just going to be far fewer uh, people able to go to the movies well that might also be why they're jamming as many people as they can while they still can well that was that was the theory someone on youtube says that maybe some fans saw that oh like they saw the writing on the wall and said everything's going to be shut down next week i'm going to go as many times as i as i can because I, I would love to see it a second time. There are things I saw in there. I'm like, did I actually see that? I feel like I need to see it again just to verify that I wasn't hallucinating. The uh, the, 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 the Edgar Wright thing. Uh, I know a lot of movies have that, but I just feel like Edgar Wright movies, it's always like, oh, I know I've missed details. And I feel like they, they, they did set up this movie to be like, like, even just from what little we have seen or I, because you've seen the movie, have seen from like the trailers and such, they were putting a lot into this movie. And like, uh, I think, was it Weekly Planet that did, or no, it was Mr. Sunday movie, but yeah, who did like the, the Easter egg breakdown for both the trailers. And it was, it was a, a lot, also a lot of speculation, but I, I expect at least some of it to kind of, to follow through. Yeah. And what's wild even looking at how it's performed with critics, it has 94% from the critics, which is the highest score a Spider-Man movie has ever gotten. And the audience score is 99%. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's, that's with over 10,000 people like have doing a rating on Rotten Tomatoes. For we've it. been starved for good movies. And finally we are being blessed, I guess. Does that mean that Bill and Ted is no longer the best movie that's come out since the pandemic? No, I, I think you, I can't remember. You'd change your mind. Uh, I think I said Dune head. had become that. Yeah. Uh, Dune has been displaced now. I would say so. I'm so reserving I'm not my gonna, judgment. All I'm really going <laughs> to say about all I'm going to say about No Way Home now is that I loved it, and it's probably one of the best Spider-Man movies ever made. That's all I'm going to say. But as a preamble to talking about far or no way home 
I thought it would be interesting to kind of just look back at the entire Spider-Man film franchise because we have had occasions throughout our podcast history to reflect on the different Spider-Man movies. I think we did one episode on the original trilogy like years ago. We did one episode ranking the movie Spider-Man at one point. We talked about Into the Spider-Verse and Venom when those movies came out. But I don't think I've had those conversations with you, so I'd be curious to hear what your no, thoughts are. I'm pretty are. sure I'm... Yeah, this is the first time I remember us talking about the other... I Honestly, I don't think I have very... Uh, a lot of hot takes. Uh, Toby Maguire was a better Peter Parker, and Andrew Garfield was a better Spider-Man. I recently rewatched the Sam Raimi movies and you know what I, I do enjoy them quite a bit um especially the first one and I yeah I, I still feel like it's actually I think we did have a conversation about it because I think we did like the conclusion we came to was that the major difference or maybe that's nope that was probably that was a nostalgia critic video that like one of the if it, if one of the, the movie series was closer to Friendly Neighborhood Spider Man, the other one Amazing Spider Man, um, and you know I, I tend to I tend to prefer the Sam Raimi movies, like the first two at least, uh, definitely to the the two that uh, uh, Andrew Garfield was Spider Man. But I liked, I think I liked all of them originally. I haven't rewatched uh, Amazing Spider Man two, so. Like, I remember being excited when that movie had ended about things that were to come and being disappointed that it got canceled, like that the series kind of fell fell flat. So I feel like I, th there are things that I want to see, I wanted to see out of it. And yeah, I think that's that's a general idea of where I stand on that. So you've seen every Spider-Man movie. Would you say you're a fan of Spider-Man? Uh, yeah, relatively. I mean, I, he is not among my favorite Marvel characters. Really? But I still... Mm, I don't know, actually, if I... Uh, because he definitely is my favorite Marvel. Yeah, I know he's above your absolute favorite. But above actually, and beyond, I could care less about any other Marvel character as long as Spider-Man existed. Uh, I think, like... See, that's the thing. Like, I do... I think he's in my, like, top Marvel characters, but kind of, like, as a default, because I don't like that many Marvel characters, especially the heroes. Um, I love a lot... It, like there are a lot of Marvel, like I, I think I've talked about this ad nauseum. Ultron is my favorite Marvel character, and he is quickly followed by Doctor Doom, uh, and then, and then there's like a huge drop, and somewhere below that drop, Spider Man is up there, but it's after a huge drop uh, in popular or in my opinion of some of these characters. So I still, I guess I yeah, I'm a Spider Man fan, but I'm not like clearly not as big a fan as you and as big a fan of people who are like really crazy about him. Yeah. Like I can remember as a kid watching the 90s Spider-Man show and having the toys. And then when I was first reading comic books, there were Spider-Man comics from like a decade earlier. And the first Sam Raimi directed Tobey Maguire starring Spider-Man, which came out in 2002, which means that, I, you know, it's been almost 20 years since that came out, and that makes me feel old. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that's I mean, we are old, but that's OK. I love that. I remember that watching the movie so many I, to this day. I feel like I can quote I can like do monologues based on that movie. Like I have so much of that dialogue memorized. I don't like that scene where um, Spider-Man and the Green Goblin are having that conversation on the rooftop. I could act out that whole scene for you if I wanted to right now. Yeah, I clearly have not that amount of love. Although, I do think that the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie is definitely the one I've seen the most. So, I don't know. There's something there. Um, so, there's been basically three separate Spider-Man film franchises over the last 20 years, which is, you've pointed out, it's kind of crazy to think about like how many movie series out there 
have had. Yeah, those are just the movie series. Like, you know, like like, how many film franchises are there that have had like three different starts in that short a time period? I mean, if you count Logan, the X Men have. Yeah, maybe, but then Logan isn't wasn't intended to go like what that was meant to like be an. No, I know, but uh, let me think. Maybe Bond. Terminator. Terminator, yeah. Because if you if you I, count Dark Fate and um, Genesis, Genesis as being part of one canon, and then the first two out of one canon, and may, maybe the first three out of one canon, but then you kind of have to put Salvation in a different one. Yeah, I mean, and I, I mean, maybe Alien. Except Aliens is a much older franchise, actually. So is Terminator. Come to maybe think of Bond, because. Like, There's how... only been two Bonds since then. There's only been Daniel Craig and Pierce Brosnan in that amount of time. Right. Wow, that's we weird to think about. Long. Yes. In the, in the entire time, in the last 20 years, there's only been two Bonds. I mean, yeah, but at the same time, like, other than the two one-offs that don't, like, uh, Timothy Dalton and uh, the one from uh, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, whose name I can never remember, George most Lazenby. Of them, yes, George Lazenby. Most of them did last a while. Fair. So it, I, I, it's not entirely surprising. But yeah, I can't think of... I, I mean, I'm sure... Uh, I mean, Pokemon? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't well, think that really counts. <laughs> the Spider-Man film franchise, unfortunately, is one of the movie series that is most tied up in the business side of Hollywood. Because people might remember Marvel Comics was going bankrupt in the 1990s. And one of the things they did to try and mitigate their losses was to sell off movie rights to their characters. Because they, they were never going to make movies about their superheroes. And so Wait, did pictures... the Fantastic Four get reset three times? Sorry. <laughs> I think... No, I mean, they had the two and then the reboot. So they only really got, re- got reset once. Right, but they are resetting it now, but it, that's going to be under the new thing, so, yeah. yeah. And even if even if that does happen before 2025, it'll be the it'll still be, like, the start of a third franchise, so I guess it would technically it would fit the criteria, but just barely. So it's funny to go back to 2002, because back then, superhero movies were just sort of becoming a thing again after the 90s uh had so many of them kind of fail x-men kind of in 2000 kind of like stepped out into the wild and played it safe kind of trying to extrapolate the core of what made of the comic book characters and then put that on the screen without getting too much into the comic bookiness but then spider-man in 2002 was really the first one to kind of go all in on like here's a superhero in a costume and it's a full-on adaptation of the comic book story with some kind of modern updates and back then superheroes didn't meet each other like every superhero basically exists in their own little world where they never really interact with other characters which to be fair spider-man was a good one to start with if you were going to do that kind of a movie because like, yes, yeah, Spider-Man is part of many Avengers group eventually, but like he is very much, he does very much stay in his own, you know, he stays in Queens for most of what he does, unless there's some big cosmic event. And even in the comics, it's, he's usually like taken away from New York in order for to go somewhere else, you know, for shenanigans to happen. So I feel like it's, it's still pretty, uh, a pretty good person to start with you're going to be going that route. And some people will actually attribute attribute the success of superhero movies as they are today to that first Spider-Man movie, because even though X-Men was received well, it wasn't a huge financial success, but Spider-Man was like a bonafide blockbuster and it sort of got everything going again. And we, we all of a sudden had multiple superhero movies coming out every year and most of them were doing well and, it's interesting for you to say that you think that's the like that's the the best one of the original trilogy because most people I talk to say they like Spider Man two the best. I I said it was the one I've seen the most. Oh right. I don't know if I. No, that's I mean, what you said. To be fair though, like 
I do also feel like hmm, it's one of the like on a technical side, I can admit that yeah, uh, the second one is better, but I think I still enjoy the first one more. To be honest, like when I watch them, I enjoyed the first Spider Man better than the second one. Like you know, Alfred Molina was great. Um, and the story was objectively better, but it just didn't hit on the same in the same way or on the same level. I found really. See, yeah. I don't like the costume as much in the first one. the The way that the spy the Spider Man suit, the changes they made between the first and the second one are like like game changing for me. Like they changed the chest logo, they changed the colors of the suit, they changed the eye design a little bit. The visual effects look way better, and it's less awkwardly cheesy like there is a lot of like and look going back and watching spider-man 2002 there are a lot of like really random goofy things happening there and you can't help but wonder why did why is this here why is the green goblin threatening uh, aunt may to finish saying the our father oh but but at the same time eh, that's that's part of the charm like it's part of what i think worked really well with it was that it was campy and it knew it and it didn't shy away from it. Like it really dove into that uh, unapologetically. And I do think that it does like, like you said, most people say that that's the reason why spider, like why superhero movies came out and came out swinging and worked. And I think that having the campiness did two things. One, it kind of got the fans, like actual fans, reignited because that was one of the things about the X Men movies. A lot of fans of X Men didn't like the first one because it was so safe, because it was so close, like because they didn't go with the you know yellow uniforms, uh, you know, and even made a joke about it. A lot of people didn't like that, and I feel like Spider Man by showing you can still make something the fans will like, that will still have a kind of broad appeal kind of prove that yeah no we're we're able to fit these kinds of movie and people will still go and watch them both the fans uh and the people we want to see them so i don't know i i I think i think there's something in the campiness of the first one that was pretty intentional and that worked and it might also just be because i love willem dafoe especially in that movie oh yeah he is iconic as the green goblin he perfect for the role for sure now spider-man 3 from 2007 this one most people don't like i've actually been i i will i i fight for this movie because yes they did they did venom dirty they did venom wrong uh, completely wrong and the way that they uh, did the black symbiote story for peter and the way that they tried to make him look feel dark didn't work but I thought everything involving the Sandman was really intriguing as far as... Which, yeah, which we mentioned, you know, these these movies are a story of things that did, you know, of studio interference and just business because originally Sam Raimi wanted to only focus on Sandman in the movie and there was a lot of pressure to add, you know, Venom, who, you know as the Venom movies have demonstrated is a, you know, a money, a sure money investment because he's a very popular character, but didn't really fit in that movie, especially with that. Yeah. How the black symbiote kind of showed up, but not really. Yeah. I would have uh, loved to see weird. a version of Spider-Man three where he can still get like, Peter can still get the symbiote, but then it ends with him at the bell tower and you, you Without... don't get Venom, and you don't get the new Goblin. Yeah, yeah, that was like they ha- were building it up, and like it was a, like, but I don't know. I waited another movie <laughs> to bring him in, or give him a better outfit. For goodness' sake, like why couldn't they just make him the Hobgoblin? That would have been so easy to do. Yeah, that I, I, I yeah, they. That 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 part of it, I I I actually kind of forgot that that the new Goblin was in that movie until you mentioned it. So that's that's how memorable he is. Um, 
yeah, no, there were definitely problems with that movie, but there were still good things about it. And yeah, I think like you said, the the Sandman stuff was solid, even though a little retconny. Uh, yeah, you know, the whole, yeah. like it was. Oh, he's really the one who killed your uncle, kind of, but not really. Some people did complain about that because not well, not just because of the retcon, but also trying to. It really felt like they were shoot, trying to make it so that every villain had a personal connection to Peter, which like is a Spider-Man thing, but not for every but, villain. Well, like comic book Sandman has no connection to Peter Parker at all. Yeah, like that one felt forced, but I but I do kind of understand that like. People like to have that with Spider-Man because he does often have a personal connection and it can work really well as we will discuss in when we get to uh, the third installment of the series. But yeah, like I understand it, but I agree. Yeah, it wasn't well handled in this context. Yeah, Spider-Man 3, it made a lot of money, but it was not received well by critics. But it made enough money that they actually did start working on Spider-Man 4. I'm not sure if you know this. They actually were full in full on development. John Malkovich was cast as the vulture. I'm Anne suddenly Hathaway. very sad this never happened. Anne Hathaway was cast as Black Cat. Okay. Which, which would have been a nice prequel to her playing. Uh, uh, wow, I almost said Sarah Connor. Um, Catwoman? <laughs> Yeah, but I was going to say her real name and then... Selena Kyle. Selena Kyle, that's what it is. Selena Kyle, Kyle Reese, Sarah Connor, at all. <laughs> no, <laughs> D- don't, don't try to defend me there. That was terrible. <laughs> so yeah, they were actually in development on Spider-Man 4, and apparently it just sort of... It reached a point where Sam Raimi, the director, was kind of fighting with the producers about what he wanted to have in the movie. Which he had already started with the previous one. Which, exactly. And the studio basically realized, you know, we're paying all of you all this extra money because this is now your fourth movie. We don't have to use you guys. So they, they sort of like shelved the, they, they sort of shut it all down and start and decide they were going to build a new Spider-Man movie from scratch. That it took a while for that to happen. Well, if you think about it, Spider-Man 3 came out in 2007, and I think it was 2010 that basically they killed production on Spider-Man 4. Okay. Yeah, that's... I guess it's not that that far off. No. And by that point... But it took a while for the new movie to come out after that, so it feels like there was more of a difference between the two. Well, and this is where the business comes in, because at this point, Marvel Studios is a thing. They start making their movies... And so because Sony has canceled Spider-Man 4, they have to make another movie. Because if they stop making Spider-Man movies, they're going to they would they they would lose the rights. So The Amazing Spider-Man, which ended up coming out in 2012, directed by Mark Webb, very appropriate director name choice for a Spider-Man movie, was the result of Marvel or Disney or Sony not wanting to lose their rights to Spider-Man. And they, you know, they tried something different, but I think a lot of people will say of the first Amazing Spider-Man, it doesn't feel different enough to war to like you. You always kind of use the logic of like, does it deserve? Does it need to exist? Yeah, and that one, that movie did not need to exist. Business-wise, it needed to. It's so yeah, it was a very necessary for Sony to create this movie, but uh, yeah, it's. And it's a little bit unfortunate because, like, you know, we're we're talking about these, right? So, like, I really did very much enjoy Andrew Garfield um, taking up the role of Spider-Man. Like, I thought he did a really good job as Spider-Man. And even though, like, yeah, there were issues with his portrayal of Peter Parker somewhat, but that had, I feel like that had a lot more to do with the way the movie was working than him, like than his performance, if you know, if that makes sense. Like, I feel yeah. like he, he performed a good Peter Parker. It's just the movie, like, within what the movie was asking, but the movie was creating a character that wasn't really Peter Parker. 
Yeah, and they were also really testing the waters of what moviegoers would accept. It's like, would you? Will they accept a full-on remake of a movie that had only come out ten years prior, and there had only been five years between, you know, Spider-Man three and this one? And for the most part, it was received generally well. It made pretty good money, but not as much money as the previous Spider-Man movies had done. Which, and again, I, it was pretty rushed. So, like, considering how quickly the production went, it did very well. Like, it did well considering. But it could have done better, and that's, I think, is where it's kind of unfortunate that it didn't. Yeah, I appreciated there was, like, a grittiness to The Amazing Spider-Man that it felt like that the uh, original movies didn't have. Like, I remember one of the first promotional images they had for the movie was this, it was a picture of, of like, of, you know, of Andrew Garfield in his Spider-Man suit with his mask off at night, uh, walking down a street with his backpack. So he's in his costume and he has his backpack and his mask is off. And you can see it's, even though it's dark, you can see that his suit is damaged and that there's like blood and dirt on his face. And I think that image, which came out like a year before the movie was released, really kind of helped me understand the tone and the feel that this movie was going to have, which just puts it in contrast with the more, I guess people put a corny flavor of the uh, Sam Raimi movies. Yeah, but, uh, and again, honestly, I feel like that's, I, I, I kind of want to skip forward and start talking about the second one because I feel like the second one informs kind of the problem people had with the first one. Well, go ahead. Yeah. So the amazing Spider-Man two yeah. years later in 2014 and it did not do well. And uh, they, they tried to shove way too many plot like they were trying to set up so many different movies. Oh yeah, like they they were trying to set up a lot of things. They they tried to like uh, you know, they they tried to put again, they tried to put two villains and one of them felt a little bit weird and out of place. Uh well, I guess three villains if you count Rhino, but I don't really count him as being in that movie. But oh, he was the there. Thing, yeah, he, he definitely was there. He, he was present on screen for a little bit. Uh, but and he was Russian. Yes, he was. And I honestly, it was hilarious. And I really enjoyed his presence in the movie. But it was just overcast by a lot of things. But I think worse than trying to cram too much in it, you know, three villains, the death of Gwen Stacy, um, and plus trying to his parents yeah and his parents and that's the problem is that there was a lot set up in the first movie that was intriguing and that was a good bait for a sequel and for expanding the universe and then the second movie put the least emphasis on that and more emphasis on all the new things they were throwing in and i thought that was very disappointing because again one of the things they were trying to do differently was the tone, was the overarching story, was the kind of self-discovery that he has in relationship with his parents. Because, you know, in the like in most Spider-Man stories, in the Sam Raimi movies, Peter Parker has just fully accepted that his aunt and uncle are his parents. Like, it's not, it's not a small thing. Like, it, it, you never, I don't think in the Sam Raimi movies, ever mention his parents other than, like, Uncle Ben saying he's not his father in the first movie. Right. right. And that was interesting. That was different. That was an aspect or an avenue they could explore. And then they pretty much did nothing with it. Well, and two, it's like you repeat again, we've seen this a couple times now. They're repeating their own mistakes. Like people complain about Spider Man three having too many villains and too much to juggle plot wise. And here we go. Seven years later, Amazing Spider Man two comes out and it's too all the villains. same. It's too yeah. many villains and too much story and too many characters. And you like they they actually filmed scenes with an actress for Mary Jane for that movie, but they ended up cutting it out because they realized they had too much going on. Well, not just that, but I'm sorry. You're you're honestly gonna put Mary Jane in the movie where Gwen Stacy like I think they that would be her. 
because you know they, no they, they i that good. still wouldn't have worked i i think people would have been upset especially considering emma stone did a really good job i think of portraying her um i know not everybody agrees with me but i think she she did do a very good job there and it kind of helped the movie pretty substantially oh yeah i definitely think she's a better female lead than i mean this is nothing against cursed and dunst but just mary jane in the original trilogy kind of had less to do oh yeah like she was a pretty bl- like again she was it's not necessarily her fault but she was written as a very bland character that was just kind of being pinballed between two guys the same way you know andrew garfield's a good actor but like his spider-man was written to be way too cool and edgy so it was kind of hard for him to not do that yeah, and Kirsten couldn't even do the comic book Mary Jane who's all sassy and kind of confident because the movie version is kind of like a mix of classic Mary Jane and classic Gwen Stacy, kind of like that good girl next door vibe going on. So she, yeah, she kind of falls in just this, oh, I'm the girl next door stereotype and screams a lot when she gets kidnapped by every villain. Which she does. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I think it was Nostalgia Critic, actually. He made the joke. It's like, you know, he doesn't tell Mary Jane who he is because he wants to keep her safe from the villains. And he's like, she's captured like five times by villains before she finds out his identity. And then it's only like once afterwards that she's kidnapped by villains. So clearly that didn't work for him. Yeah, he should have just kept her safe by uh, telling her who he was. So The Amazing Spider-Man 2 comes out and it like unlike spider-man 3 which made a lot of money and then was received poorly the amazing spider-man 2 just was received poorly and it Bombs by 2021 movie standards it made a lot of money but by 2014 standards it did not like it came out the same year as guardians of the galaxy and the winter soldier to give context of like what was what else was happening in superhero movies at the time and it definitely could not hold a candle to those two. Oh, days of futures past came out that same year as well yeah, that was a pretty good year for comic book movies. Just yeah. bad year for uh, Spider- Spider-Man. <laughs> for the Spider-Man. Oh, and debacle. Big Hero 6 came out that year, too. Uh, you like yeah. that one, don't you? I, 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 I do. I'm just... Look, the comparison with the other ones isn't quite the same. All right, fair enough. So, seemingly, all the plans for all these movies that Sony were going to make were kind of killed when amazing spider-man 2 failed and then in 2015 there was this rumbling that marvel studios had reached out to sony and had sort of pitched the idea of collaborating with them which got all of us fans very excited because you know as excited as it had been to see the mcu develop and to see all these characters cross over ultimately some people were very sad that spider-man wasn't there (laughs) Yes, and I would be included among that. So when it was announced in 2015 that Marvel Studios and Sony Pictures had reached an agreement to essentially share access to Spider-Man, I at least was very overjoyed. And I think the first question was, is Andrew Garfield coming back? Because at that point, he'd only played the role twice. It seemed like a good idea to just bring him into the fold. But they announced fairly quickly that it wasn't going to be him that they were going to cast a new actor. Now, looking back on all this, would you have rather they had just stuck with Andrew Garfield? Oh, I mean, hindsight is 2020 and I, Hmm. That depends. If they were doing the same movie, no, he was too old at that point to fit what that movie was doing. Right, so if we had um, if we had Andrew Garfield in Civil War, he'd be like, "No, he's too old for this." Well, no, not in Civil War. In the uh, okay, I guess yeah. If he had just been in Civil War, I, I was thinking more of uh, uh, you know Homecoming because that is definitely a high, a very high school um, centric story, and Andrew Garfield was barely pulling off high school when he you know uh, <laughs> when he originally took up the role in two thousand and twelve, and now it was. What, homecoming was 2017 17 yeah like yeah, he could no longer pull that off um but i don't know actually uh, 
yes, I think I would have liked to see Andrew Garfield in Civil War. Even, and that's not like, a, I don't think he's necessarily better than, um, Tom Holland, the British Tom boy. Holland, yeah. My, well, Andrew I, Garfield's British too, actually, so they're both British boys. Yeah, but like, I, like, and the way the Tom Holland movies have gone, which we're going to talk about, I think work, but, and, and that's the thing, is like, if he had showed up, they would have had to continue his franchise and his franchise was dead in the water and probably shouldn't be continued. So like, it's kind of unfortunate, but I, I do think it was on the whole for the better that Tom Holland took over. But yes, actually, if all I got of Spider-Man in the MCU was the fights, essentially just the fight scene in um, Civil War, I would have rather have uh, Andrew Garfield. I remember when that first trailer showed up for Civil War that showed what Spider-Man was going to look like in the MCU. And the second I saw the eyes change size, I thought this is, I was just so excited because Spider-Man in the comic books, you know, his eyes have always kind of defied logic by changing size to like, you know, express emotion. And they found a very clever way to replicate that in a way that kind of makes sense scientifically. Kind of. <laughs> I'm doing air quotes while saying scientifically for our audience. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it it worked. And and again, like... Uh, with just the, was... one, the one scene he had with Robert Downey Jr. in his bedroom to kind of like show us who he was. Because you're right. Yeah. The rest of his role in Civil War is just the fight scene, basically. And to be honest... Again, if, Spider, if, if Amazing Spider-Man 2 hadn't been really bad... And especially been really bad. Like, here's the thing: if it would have still barely touched on his parents' backstory, but then not been as bad, easy tie in his parents' backstory to to to, um, to, to Tony Stark, and then have Andrew Garfield and um, Robert Downey Jr. Wow, I names are all escaping me today. Um, I, I should have just said Iron Man. Be in the scene together and have that link and indicate it and be like, wow, mind blown. And then, you know, not have Aunt May be 20. Um, but... Well, I mean, Spider-Man's parents in the comics are S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. Or they were yeah. before they died. So it would have been a very natural way to, you know, fold them into the MCU as well. Yeah, again, but... if Spider Amazing Spider-Man 2 hadn't been terrible, that would have been great. <laughs> And again, you know, really testing what audiences are willing to accept because we had a us Spider, Spider we had a Spider Man in 2014, and then all of a sudden, not even t full two years later, we're now introducing a new actor as Spider Man. And lucky for Tom Holland, or I don't know, good for him, good for the people involved with making Civil War, he was received so well. Like people thought, like I certainly saw him as one of the highlights of that whole movie, even though he had such limited screen time. He he just for me, he pulled it off well. Like, like, I think calling him a highlight of the movie is a bit much, but you're a huge Spider-Man fanboy, so I, I can accept it. But at the same time, he did a very good job. And I think that, generally speaking, Tom Holland is a very good Spider-Man slash Peter Parker. Because, uh, you know, the argument that, you know, Tobey Maguire was the best Peter Parker, and then Andrew Garfield was the best Spider-Man, and uh, Tom Holland is just the better overall at the role um i don't know if i totally agree with it because oh that's my argument uh i still think that uh hmm. well this is i think that toby mcguire was better overall than tom holland is overall but he was limited by the movies he was in um more so than his capacity as an actor uh Personally, that's how I feel about it. Uh, but but I do but I do feel like yes, Tom Holland did a very good job. Like he was still comparable to both of them, both as Peter Parker and as uh, Spider Man. Like enough to be able to be received, uh, yeah, with enough popular acclaim that he worked as a character. Yeah, and Tom Holland. He made five appearances as Spider-Man over a period of four years. Five different MCU or Sony movies. So he was 
we saw a lot of him in the role. And I know I've talked about this. Other people have talked about this. The big complaint people have with the MCU version of Spider-Man up until the time No Way Home had come out is that for a lot of people, he doesn't feel like Spider-Man. He kind of just feels like Iron Man Jr. Or, he, you know, it feels like everything is handed to him and that he's not really, he doesn't have the Parker luck. He's not. I Yes and no. The thing is like, it depends on whether you consider the Sony movies to be part of the canon or not. Because I think if you just take Spider-Man as he appears in the MCU, yes, I agree. He's a little bit too much Iron Man Jr. But I think especially with Homecoming, you get Spider-Man as he is and like as he should be. And it's more intimate and, uh, you know, and again, the villain has a direct link to him, which is something, you know, that is very Spider-Man slash Batman. Um, and that works very well. And so I, I feel like, like, I understand the criticism. And I think that um, it definitely kind of hit hard in um, Far From Home. Like, I think in that movie, it was it was a little bit of that. But at the same time, they kind of had to because of what Mysterio was. And I wouldn't take that away because I thought Mysterio was amazing and made that work. Yeah, I mean, so we have so we get Spider-Man Homecoming in 2017, and it's a return to a high school story. It's inspired by John Hughes's movies. And, and Michael Keaton steals the show. And Michael Keaton is the great as the vulture. But again, even he is kind of like, he's a product of Iron Man. Like he's not, he does have a connection to Peter, but he's the reason he's a villain is because of something Tony Stark did. Uh, was it Tony Stark or was it shield though? Like it was damage control that he was upset with. And Tony Stark was the one who kind of got damage control going. So I, I guess, but it was still, I feel like it was more of a, like, I feel like if there is somebody really responsible for what happened, it's more on Nick Fury's head than on Tony Stark's head because he definitely had more control over those things. And he's the reason why all of the salvage was being done specifically for, you know, by Stark enterprise and for shield. Like, sure, but if you yeah. look at even Vulture's dialogue in the movie, he like he never t- mentions Nick. Yeah, Fury. from his point, of, but that's because Nick Fury is a ghost. Like nobody knows about him except but, the Avengers. But that's what I mean. Is that like from the experience of the villain and what he's t- when he's talking to Spider Man, he's talking about Iron Man. He's not talking about Spider Man necessarily. Yeah, that's. Uh... <laughs> Listen, um, I love Homecoming. I think it's it's fun. It's funny. It's very clever. It has a lot of heart to it. It recreates the famous scene from Amazing Spider-Man issue 33 where he's like lifting all that heavy stuff from on top of him. Yeah. But I will acknowledge like, yeah, in terms of being, it's not a very good Spider-Man movie. It's a good Marvel I, movie that Spider-Man is in. I guess. Like, I still think it's a good Spider-Man movie. Because even though Tony Stark starts it, they kind of ignore what he's like, you know, that there is this, it does paint Spider-Man as an outsider a little bit. Like, yeah, there's more Tony in it. And some of the scenes that probably could have been cut where he shows up. But I still think that it works because well, it, it works, is still but... Peter Parker doing his own thing. But he, like his, again, his motivation is tied to like, Oh, like I got to impress Mr. Stark or I got yeah, that's Mr. True. Stark now. And that's yeah. when, when far from home comes out, it's post Avengers end game, you know, in 2019, you think, Oh, Tony Stark is dead now. So we can move past Iron Man. And yet the villain has his origin tied to Iron Man. Uh, a big part of his motivation continues to be Iron Man. And there's this question like, who will be the next Iron Man? And I'm like sitting there going like, it shouldn't be Spider-Man. Spider-Man is his own guy. He doesn't need to be Iron Man. Yeah, like, I, I'm not saying I disagree with this criticism altogether. I just, I find that up until, like, definitely Far From Home hammered it a little bit too hard. 
but Which again, I, I also enjoyed it. Like, I enjoyed Far oh, From Home. Oh yeah, no, like it was a great movie. Mysterio. But was great. here's the thing: is that that's the thing. Mysterio worked super well, and the parts of it, unfortunately, that weren't tied to the MCU were the weaker parts of that movie. And I think it's just my age showing, because like, oh, a high school summer road trip romance. I'm like. <laughs> okay i'm getting a little i don't care as much about this anymore <laughs> yeah no i was i was all there for jake gyllenhaal and <laughs> honestly if if mysterio hadn't worked in that movie it would have been a terrible movie but he did very well and i but think you, you you do raise a good point here it's like if we were to try and turn take homecoming and far from home and trying to like construct those without all the mcu connections would they still work or would they still like? Would they be as enjoyable movies? I think Homecoming could still work because honestly, him uncovering the weapons that are being made, like yes, in the movie, his motivation is trying to impress Mister Stark. But like, if you're going very Spider Man, he could just be like, because because the reason it all starts is because there's gang buying the weapons from Vulture, right? Mm-hmm. And that is a very Spider-Man thing, trying to keep the gangs away from super weapons. Like that is that's how he discovers it. Is there's this bank heist where they have, which he's doing as a routine Spider-Man, you know, friendly neighborhood Spider-Man thing, and he discovers it. There doesn't need to be the connection to the MCU for that story to still work. And I think that even like even Vulture's motivation, how he turns out other places in the plot, still work even without it being Tony Stark's fault and even without it being specifically linked to like, like, yes, his character does rely on getting alien technology, but like that could be, that could be from anything else that doesn't have to be a specific MCU event. It could even be from like, it could be from Doc Ock's lab blowing up. Like it could have been from a, a Spider-Man villain um problem and so that one yes the way mysterio plays is just way too intrinsically like entrenched with iron man i don't think the um far from home would work but you could rewrite that origin to like oh some rich guy stole my invention you could but i don't think that would necessarily work and if you want mysterio to be kind of the big um team thing that he was um it w- you you definitely need to have it tied into the greater universe. I think, um, although you know, you could have Mysterio just have magic power, you know, and be a good setup. Like you could, it's not a good idea, but but like, but even if Mysterio's powers were just illusion based, which when he does kind of have magic powers, that's what it is. You could still get away with that, but I don't think it definitely works as well. So I get the sense you like homecoming more than far from home. Yes, but I'm also a huge Michael Keaton fanboy, And, uh, but I also think that the story was stronger. I'd have to go rewatch homecoming. Cause I, I think because it does show Spider-Man coming into his own more, I like Far From Home more than Homecoming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can understand that. But at the same time, like you said, he does kind of rely on the Stark technology to get his suit back at the end. And yeah, I mean... Like, I feel like... I feel like there's just as much interference from the MCU in both movies, but because, like I said, it's not necessary in the first movie, I feel like the story works better especially as a Spider-Man story. Right. And I guess we should also mention into the Spider-Verse because that is a technically part of like the Spider-Man film franchise. But we, we've yeah. spoken about this before. It is the epitome of what a good Spider-Man movie should be. But I also think it's worth talking about in this conversation because I don't think the third Spider-Man movie would have necessarily been Multiverse of Madness if that movie hadn't done as well. So in other words, because they took a risk making into the Spider-Verse and it was received well, you think that kind of galvanized all the people to be like, we could try to this for a live action movie too. Yeah. 
And like, I'm not saying it was the only reason because obviously these things are long years in preparation, but I do feel like there would have, so I think there would have been a multiverse movie regardless, but it might've been much more Dr. Strange than Spider-Man if Into the Spider-Verse hadn't been done and done wonderfully well. Yeah, like I was actually shocked. <laughs> I mean, just something like a, a multiverse, multiple versions of it. It just—it's so easy to go go wrong. But oh, yeah, the Spider Verse, everything went right. Yeah, Spider yeah. into the Spider Verse is yeah the best Spider Man movie ever made. Like I don't think anybody argues that point. Well, let me tell you, No Way Home. Again, not to say much, but it 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 it's it's really Academy Award level stuff listen some people are saying no way home might get a best picture nomination because of how well it's done yeah but also what is it competing with this year? <laughs> <laughs> actually it's competing with doom so uh <laughs> but uh, yeah. i do also appreciate like into the spider-verse for taking characters from the comics like the miles morales spider-man and spider gwen and really making them accessible to larger audiences because there were characters I was aware of from having read comics, but they like, they made these really obscure yeah. characters like really well known. And now everyone's excited aware for the sequel to that. Spider Gwen. I no, I knew about Spider Gwen. I was aware of Miles Morales, but only because my wife is a huge Marvel fan. Oh, I can't wait for you to see this movie with her. <laughs> yeah i'll try to get her on the recording of the next episode because i think that might be uh worth it at this point yeah so here we are it's 2021 spider-man no way home the third the, the the third oh man it's the third it's the third third spider-man but there's only it's the second time there's been a spider-man three it's the cubic spider-man three to the power of three yeah it is crazy to think about ignoring just you think of all these movies we've talked about it's like wow we're in the third third reset of a franchise and now we're in the third installment of the third re of the second reset and by all accounts it's going to include things from the first two as well because which like frankly, that's, is, that's, is not, just, that's not a spoiler that's been that's been confirmed that there are elements from the sam raimi movies and uh amazing Mark spider-man Wayne. movies that will show up as well yeah. Yeah. I mean, if Mark you've seen Rex. the trailer, yeah, yeah you, you see. And frankly, like, I think that was a very brilliant move on their part because they can sort of just borrow the established story. They from... can, but is it a nostalgia bomb? You know the answer to this, but like, but you should also ask yourself that because I, uh, you are prone. <laughs> I mean, everybody is, but you, you have been known to be prone to nostalgia bombing as well. And Listen, you have lived through all of these. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, okay. Let, let's just pause it there because we, we won't be able to. All if right. I yeah. If I say much more, I will. I will be like Doctor Strange, trying to contain the multiverse from exploding right here on this podcast. Or like Benedict Cumberbatch, trying to keep Tom Holland from spoiling the MCU. Yeah. So that has been our kind of like breeze through the entire Spider-Man movie franchise up until No Way Home come back next week we'll talk about the new movie itself i'm very excited for beeper to see it uh if you want to get a hold of us we'll remind you how to do that if you want to reach the show you can send us an email at batjarpodcast at gmail.com or you can tweet us at the bat cookie jar you can find the bat jar podcast wherever you listen to podcasts including youtube because we got a channel share our posts on facebook write reviews give our shows a rating this will help all people join us inside the bat jar and we appreciate it dearly and there's no need to go inside the bat jar because we're gonna be talking about no way home next week uh yeah we are it th there will find things to talk about that are non-spoilers but there's so much of this movie that is not in the trailers that we're going to need like a big we're going to spend a lot of time inside the spoiler verse so just if you haven't seen the movie I'd recommend seeing it if you can. And besides, I mean, look, you listen to this podcast. It means you have a presence on the internet. How long are you going to be able to keep away from spoilers about this movie? Exactly. And this episode or our next episode will come out after Christmas. So 
Beef pork ribs. Uh, right. Come out on the tw- the twenty seven month twenty seven. So yes, beef pork ribs. Merry Christmas, and to all, good night. <laughs> uh, well, until next week when we are actually in the Christmas season, liturgically. I'm Average Joe, and I'm Beef Pork Ribs. Catch on the flip side, and to all, good night. <laughs>